guys, we need to talk about Boiling Point. Do the right thing. You go under, so do I. I want to stop, I really want to stop. This was genuinely a text I sent moments after the credits started rolling. <laughs> was I overexcited? <laughs> Quite possibly. Was I dazzled by the tantalising long take? You guys know how easily I'm seduced by a lingering camera shot. But no, I've reflected. I've calmed. <laughs> I genuinely think that this is a masterpiece. I love it. <laughs> by the way, if you're new, hi, I'm Helena. Excuse the coldy voice. Guess who got COVID? <laughs> Again. <laughs> yeah, because once just isn't enough. Anyway, boiling point. Let's chat. Created by this sexy scouser, Mr. Philip Barantini, this masterful one-shot restaurant drama follows struggling head chef Andy in real time as he deals with dilemmas both professional and personal on one of the busiest nights of the year. It deals with the themes of mental health, addiction, family, isolation, all under the relentless pressure of a camera that never cuts away. So today we're going to use some insights from Michael Z. Newman's brilliant book, indie and American film culture to see just how and why Boiling Point is such a masterpiece in independent cinema. Spoilers will ensue, so we'll go watch it first and then come back when you're ready to <laughs> turn up the heat. I'll stop. A few info -y bits up top, like I said, directed by <laughs> Philip Barantini, <laughs> sorry, um, who also co-wrote it with James Cummings and they adapted and expanded this movie from Barantini's original 2019 short film of the same name. So let's begin by asking, what is independent cinema? In this book, Nima discusses how the term indie is really difficult to define. Some people focus on a definition based on business and economics, referring to movies that are produced and distributed outside of big budget Hollywood studios and mainstream theatres. However, since the 1990s, uh, this categorization has become less important with things like style and aesthetic becoming a more dominant mode of categorization. So taking into account these changes of definitions, Nima Newman suggests instead that indie is a cultural category rather than just a set of formal or industrial conventions. His three categories, that of character focused realism, formal play, and oppositionality, help define the term indie more succinctly. Normally, indie films will display one or two of these categories. Boiling Point displays all three. <laughs> so let's delve into each one to see why exactly Boiling Point is such an exemplary indie movie. Let's look at the first strategy. Independent films see characters as emblems of their social identities. Independent cinema offers us films with character-focused narratives, usually with characters having more depth and complexity than their Hollywood counterparts. Realism is central, with characters often being deeply flawed or confusing to define. They don't easily fall into the stereotypes of hero versus villain. Boiling Point is heralded for its realism. The formal elements such as the long take and the real-time shooting, which <laughs> we will get onto, don't you worry, <laughs> the help in this regard, but it's also the characterization which makes this film feel so real. We can see this complexity in Andy. As he becomes overwhelmed by his personal stresses, he lashes out at his co-workers. In the film's opening, we see the health inspector has docked the restaurant two stars due to its incomplete record keeping. Andy attempts to shift the blame onto the junior chefs, a decidedly arsehole move. Yet later we see him apologise and take time teaching new techniques to the younger chefs, clearly excited to see talent emerging and willing to nurture the next generation. He opposes the bitterness of his ex-mentor and celebrity chef friend, <laughs> Alistair. A difference in character is most noticeable in a really small moment near the end of the film. A table of obnoxious influencers ask Andy for some water for the table, a task usually performed by the lowest level of waiting staff, not by head chefs. Alistair gets annoyed at the boys for asking such a question of the head chef, saying that they should ask one of the girls. <laughs> When the camera pans slightly, we see that Andy has already gone and asked one of the servers without kicking up any fuss. This moment of humility versus Alistair's pomposity silently shows Andy's character, showing how, despite his success, he's still humble enough to serve water to a table of arseholes. <laughs> it is these moments of warmth and humility that are peppered throughout the film. <laughs> That one was unintentional. <laughs> Another is when the overbearing manager slash daughter of the restaurant owner is shouted at by the chefs. This is kind of deserved, 
uh, unempathetic, money-focused mindset is causing a toxic working environment. However, when the camera follows to linger outside the bathroom stall, her crying can be heard as she leaves a message to her dad saying how she doesn't know what she's doing, presumably having been left unequipped and pressured by her father to make sure the restaurant is making lots of money. I also love the detail of the fact that he doesn't pick up the phone when she tries to call him, showing just how isolated she is also as a character, even if we don't like her very much. A more mainstream film would probably leave her as a character that we are meant to hate, sort of the bitch of the film, but Boiling Point gives all these periphery characters the time and depth and complexity, so we, we have that connection to everyone in the film. Independent cinema is often termed a cinema of outsiders, focusing their plots on characters who are underrepresented in Hollywood. Like so many people, I have worked in bars and restaurants and pubs, and it was incredibly empowering and validating to see it represented so authentically and so respectfully, giving time to people who are working minimum wage jobs, who are working antisocial hours, and who are treated often really badly by the people people they have to serve in order to make a living. It felt such a unique experience watching this play out on film and I think that's why so many people have connected to this film. Also it's set in Dalston, <laughs> which was my local area for years so <laughs> that was cool to see. <laughs> can you even imagine, can you even conceive that Hollywood would create a film with such a simple premise that revolves solely around the stress that comes from working in such a fast-paced demanding industry? The main plot point here is that Andy is an absent but loving father and he's struggling to speak to or see his son because of his work situation. That's the film. <laughs> yes there are multiple other plots but essentially it is the disconnection that a father feels to his son and his fear that his son thinks that he doesn't love him. In this book Newman highlights that it is precisely this quality of ordinariness of human life as daily adventure just as worthy of our interest as the heightened spectacles of the megaplex that give this strain of indie films their value in relation to studio films. It is this dedication to represent ordinary experience that makes Boiling Point so special. Moving on, the second viewing strategy is to read into the film's formal play. Guys, <laughs> we're talking about the long take. <laughs> so obviously the USP of this film is that it was shot in one long continuous take. And I mean it is actually one take. It's none of this cheating, hidden cuts, trickery, mind games that some films have chosen to do recently. Just kidding, I really like that film. <laughs> but no, Boiling Point had the audacity, the audacity <laughs> to do one 92 minute long take. It's exciting stuff. <laughs> they filmed this over two days and did two takes a night and what we see in the film is the third take they used. There you go. You'll have that for free. <laughs> it is this kind of what Newman calls play with filming technique. It's the risk taking and the innovative creativity that sets independent cinema apart from mainstream films. The spectator sees the challenging form as a conceptual structure that defies one's convention bound expectations. In a regularly shot film we would have things like shot reverse shot to see how characters have reacted to what other people have said. We probably also have a lot of flashbacks to how the characters got to this moment and even more likely this film would be set over a number of days, weeks, maybe even years. But Barantini doesn't do this. <laughs> His strict structure means that we are claustrophobically involved in the events of this night. <laughs> The long take creates a relentless pressure that the viewer can't look away from. The tension is never relieved by a cut until the film ends with Andy literally collapsing from the pressure. The take is an allegory or a reflection, a mirror of sorts, for Andy's internal consciousness, representing the intense pressure that he is under. The take only cuts when Andy literally loses consciousness. The long take also creates tension from the way the tone changes so quickly in the film. The lines between personal and professional, public and private, blurred as these boundaries are seamlessly crossed by Matthew Lewis's wandering camera. Such as in one moment we see the servers talking amongst themselves, a warm portrait of the kinds of family bonds you form with those you work so closely with. We then follow Andrea as she serves the table of a sort of big spender type whose racism is quickly revealed as he talks down to her. The change of tone from comforting familiarity to this really horrific experience someone has to go through represents the unpredictability and hardship of the industry. In another heartbreaking scene we see the kind pastry chef and her young apprentice working together. As she pulls up his sleeves she sees marks of self-harm and the two share an intimate and private moment, again showing the complexity of these characters 
the warmth of these family bonds and how quickly the tone can change from stress or joking around to addressing hidden trauma. By not having cuts, the film shows how close to the surface trauma lies and how quickly it can break through the exterior we present to the world. This unpredictability of human experience is then reflected back into the unpredictability of the long take itself. The long take, therefore, is not used as a gimmick. It functions to embody and mirror the film's themes. Equally, if the film didn't use a long take, it would still be an incredible character piece. Michael Newman points to Jason Mattel's really important essay on narrative complexity. He argues that an audience's enjoyment of narrative complexity stems from both getting swept away in a realistic narrative world and from marvelling at the narrative pyrotechnics. This he calls the operational aesthetic where a large part of the enjoyment of watching a film comes from the ingenuity of the filmmaking and the spectator trying to work out how the film was made. When we watch the long take, we sort of get pulled out of the narrative as we marvel at the ability of the actors to sustain such performances for so long, the choreography of the camera work and the sort of prep in order to make it so seamless. We are on edge, constantly wondering how close a film is to failing. The viewer has to work to gain a deeper understanding in this film. We can't rely on editing to tell us where to look or to tell us what is important. The viewer has to work it out themselves. The final strategy lies outside of the film text. It's one of opposition, Newman proclaiming, when in doubt, read as anti-Hollywood. Both the realism and formalism of the other two strategies can overlap with Hollywood films. Like I said, 1917 is formally complex, whilst films like Forrest Gump can be read as character-centred narratives. It is this third category that gives us the complete definition that places independent as a relational category to Hollywood. Newman argues that the ideal of independent cinema is as an authentic, autonomous alternative. Authentic insofar as a film is recognised to be the sincere production of an artist, autonomous to the extent that the artist is free to pursue their personal agenda and not constrained by business demands. The production of Boiling Point shows this authenticity and autonomy. Firstly, the creative process came from building on a short film that Barantini had already created. This feels like a passion project that Barantini crafted and worked on over a number of years with a really small team. Presumably his creative decisions were given more autonomy because of the success of the short film. Arguably also the film's low budget also added to more creative control as there were less businessy minds <laughs> that might have led to a sort of safer filming process and less risks being taken. Barantini also used small independent production companies such as Vertigo Releasing, Burton Fox Films and Ascendant. He also started his own independent production company called Three Little Birds Pictures alongside Samantha Warham and Sarah Sedev. It was difficult to find out too much about this company's involvement in the film but the takeaway is Barantini had clear creative control and autonomy over the creative process. Newman doesn't specifically talk about experience as authenticity when making a film, but I think in this case it is important. Barantini was a chef for 12 years and everything in Boiling Point he says he has either witnessed or has happened to him. His experience gives a film even further authenticity as the complexities and nuances shine through. I've said my piece. <laughs> that is why Boiling Point is a masterpiece in independent cinema. But before you rush off, I have some recommendations for you. For my bookworms, check out Sweet Visser by Stephanie Danler if you like restaurant based narratives. Set in New York following a girl in her early 20s struggling with her own issues and demons. Incredible portrayal of service and the stress of working in a restaurant but it also has lots of other personal dynamics going on. Similar vibes to my year of rest and relaxation and for my film buffs <laughs> I keep being reminded of Slacker by Richard Linklater, uh, which came out in 1990. Very different tone. <laughs> very different tone. But the film uses very long takes and is set over a 24 hour period following mostly sort of college students around the streets of Austin, Texas. Nothing much happens, but if you like this meandering long take localised filming setting, then go check it out. Finally, if you just couldn't get enough of the stress of Boiling Point, then I've heard Uncut Gems is very similar. I haven't actually seen it. And yes, I know I need to. <laughs> I've heard it's similar vibes, so go check that out. 
maybe. <laughs> Anyway, there we go, that was one point. Let me know what you think of this film in the comments. And if you did like this video, you might also like my video essay on Haunting of Hill House and Bly Manor, or on Booksmart and Teen Narratives. So I'm assuming they're on the screen now, but I could be wrong. <laughs> anyway, feel free to subscribe, share, like. It makes me really quite happy. I will see you very soon in another one. Bye guys. <laughs>